Okay, I think I think the um, the wait room is slowed down, so we can probably uh, probably start. Okay. So, I, I, shall I make the welcoming remarks then and hand it over to you, Veronica? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Thanks, Douglas. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, or <laughs> really early good morning if you're in Australia. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to welcome everybody to I, I think our ninth or tenth event in the the, the um, virtual lecture series. And today, of course, we're talking about the portfolio workshops, and it's going to be a two-part event. We're doing the first part today with experts from around the world talking about um, what to look for in a portfolio, what to have in your portfolio. But then in January, oh, now I'm going to forget, January 7th or 14th, Veronica? It's the 7th. The 7th. We're going to have students from around the world present their portfolios to the same team of experts and uh, get some feedback. <laughs> Um, looks like we've got a good crowd from around the world this morning, and I'm going to hand it over to Veronica Madonna from the, the Center for Architecture to, to do some introductions. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Douglas. And thanks everyone for joining us here today for the portfolio um, workshop. We're truly excited to do this. Um, not only to you know um, help and give some tips to all of you, but also um, to be joined by our collabor collaborating uh, universities. Um, and so I have the pleasure of, of introducing everyone. And before I do, I just wanted to speak a little bit about the structure for today. Today, we're gonna to have a number of presentations. Douglas is gonna kick us off to talk about composition and um, uh, color, font, and graphics. And then our panelists are gonna join and talk about what they feel makes an impressive portfolio because a portfolio is actually a very critical tool in terms of, um, you know, getting opportunities for jobs and applying to schools in terms of um, making the first impression, because often it is the first impression to who you are and, and who, what your abilities are in, in design and, and in the creative field. So it's, it's really a great um, workshop we have here today. And I just want to thank everyone for being here today. So we're going to have uh, lectures for about an hour, just over an hour. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers. And so I, I invite everyone to type in their questions into the chat box um, as we go along. And we'll try to address all of them before uh, the end of the session. And then on January 7th, the session is going to be a more intensive workshop where we're going to be inviting a number of students to come in, present their workshop, uh, sorry, present their portfolio and get uh, specific feedback from um, our panelists that will hopefully guide and help everyone who's watching. So I encourage everyone to join the second studio uh, workshop as well, the portfolio workshop. So just to kick us off, I'm going to just introduce everyone. It might take me about five minutes to kind of go through everyone, but I really want to give an introduction. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Rudolf Peralt, who um, teaches architectural technology at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town, South Africa. After his architectural studies at the University of the Free State, he completed a part-time master's degree in, South, uh, sorry, in African studies while taking up employment at CPUT in 2007. More recently, he completed a joint PhD in architecture and geography at the University of the Halsalt in Belgium and Stellenbosch in South Africa, engaging in live project research on architectural practice in the context of informal settlement upgrading. He teaches design and technology related subjects in the uh, diploma and advanced diploma programs at CPUT and is currently developing two further postgraduate qualifications in architecture, a postgraduate diploma and professional master's degree. As coordinator of internationalization in the Department of Architectural Technology and Interior, he is excited about the prospects of further collaboration with the Global Studio. Uh, next, we have uh, Karen Sound from uh, the School of Architecture Academy of Art uh, University in San Francisco. So Karen is an undergraduate assistant director of the School of Architecture at the Academy of Art uh, University. In on-site and online teaching, she seeks to bring inclusivity to architectural education. She is a contributing author in a forthcoming book on the pedagogy of examining ident identity formation within the architectural design studio. Prior to teaching, she had uh, leadership positions at Skidman, uh, Skidmore, Owens and Merrill in New York and San Francisco, working collaboratively with large international teams on award-winning projects ranging from high rise to institutional buildings in the US and the Middle East. She is a licensed architect in California and New York and is a lead accredited, uh, accredited professional. Karen has previously taught at UC Berkeley and has uh, been a guest critic at various institutions in the US and in Korea. 
She holds a Master's of Architecture with distinction from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture with high honors from UC Berkeley. We're also joined by Francesco Mancini. Dr. Francesco Mancini is an Italian registered architect and planner who currently works at Curtin University as an associate professor, School of Design in the Built Environment, and acting deputy pro vice chancellor uh, of the Faculty of Humanities. He is a member of the Australian Architectural Program Accreditation Review Panel, member of the Board of Architects of Western Australia, and represents Curtin Architecture and the Architectural Association of Architects School of Australia and the Australian Institute of um, Architects Educational Committee. Before joining Curtin University in 2015, Dr. Mancini was, uh, um, sorry, has taught and researched uh, since 1998 at the University of Rome Tre where he served as a research fellow and assistant professor of architectural design in the Department of Architecture. His teaching philosophy is based on learning as a social and collaborative practice, focusing on shared problem solving uh, strategies and approach. Dr. Mancini is an architectural theorist interested in urban studies, architectural language and critical design thinking. He taught with international eminent scholar and architect Peter Eisman at the Cooper Union School of Architecture in New York. He also taught architect architectural design at the University of Water, uh, Waterloo School of Architecture, Rome, the Pratt Institute, Rome, and the Iowa State University College of Design, Rome. Dr. Mancini practices in Riyadh, um, Saudi Arabia, and returned to Rome in 2001 to establish an architectural practice. Mancini serves as a design advisor for the city of Rome, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Chief of Staff Defense. He has published on Peter Eisman's work, Building Typology and Urban Morphology. Uh, Dr. Mancini holds a PhD from the University of Florence on conceptual representation of architecture in the work of Peter Eisman. Welcome. Um, we also have um, Henry Sang. Uh, Dr. Henry Sang is an architect and assistant professor at Athabasca University's REIC Center for Architecture based in Calgary, Alberta. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Architecture and Masters of Architecture at McGill University and holds a PhD from the University of Tokyo in Japan. Henry possesses over 18 years of global design and teaching experience. He is a former senior architect at Japanese mega firm Nikon Seki um, and has also worked for uh, Nikon AXS Satao, uh, Masura Senda and Lame Michaud. Uh, Sang has also held a professorship at Kenyang University in South Africa, uh, sorry, in South, uh, South Korea, and directed the Sustainable Architecture Program at Hersing College in Montreal. He has been awarded uh, Canada's Educator of the Year um, by the National Association of Career Colleges, uh, Robert, Robert Fung International Award of Distinction by McGill University, and most recently, a Canadian Architect Award of Excellence for his design uh, of the Canadian Japanese Cultural Center which was just published in the Canadian Architect um, uh, edition. And we're, our, uh, we're gonna kick it off with a presentation from our chair, uh, Dr. Douglas McLeod. I'm just gonna give a brief introduction to Douglas. He is the chair of the RAIC Center of Architecture at Athabasca University, uh, an online program that's quickly growing to be one of the largest and most innovative in the world. He is recognized as an expert in e-learning, regenerative design and virtual design. Um, Douglas is a registered architect, a contributing editor to Canadian Architect Magazine, and a former executive director of the Canadian Design Research Network. He's also a former associate with Barton Myers Associates in Los Angeles, and over the last 30 years, um, Douglas has led visionary projects ranging from pioneering work to virtual uh, reality to the BAM Center of, uh, to uh, EduSource Canada, the largest Canadian e-learning uh, innovative, um, innovate, innovative to, to date. My apologies. <laughs> um, thank you all. I really appreciate everyone for being here. Um, and we're going to kick it off with uh, Douglas. Do you want to share your screen? All right. Oh, so you, you can't see my screen at the moment? Oh, I can see your screen. Sorry. All right. All right. Wonderful. So we're going to be talking, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basics of graphic design. Now, some people may be experts in graphic design, but let's sort of assume that, that you're not. The first thing I wanted to do is I, I've used student work throughout and, and I wanted to thank those students again. This is an example, David's uh, wonderful rendering of this, this Zeppelin in the clouds, um, but I'll be showing other work. And again, I wanted to thank those students for allowing their work to be used. So 
what we're going to talk about really briefly is type, color, layout, and content. And the basic rule, I think, if you're not an expert graphic designer and you're putting together a portfolio for the first time, keep it simple. But here's the thing. I, I, when I was doing some of my research, I came across this, this study that said that people form aesthetic impressions of a website, so it'll be the same as your portfolio, in 50 milliseconds. In other words, in the snap of your fingers, somebody has decided whether your site is, whether your designs, your portfolio, your website is good or not. And that's gonna persist throughout their entire visit to your website or your portfolio. So in other words, everything matters. And when I say everything, you've gotta think about all of these things. And I wanna be, um, I wanna make sure that everybody knows this uh, session is being recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel, but also I'll try and put the, my set of slides up in our publication section of our website. So you don't have to write all of this down, but just note that there's a lot to consider and this is a good checklist. But the most important things is what is the first impression you're gonna make and what is the last impression? So try and think about things in terms of that. So let's talk briefly about type. Here's what I want you to not do. Um, we call this font pollution, where you use a lot of fonts in a lot of different colors, put them at different angles, and, and that's really not going to, to work very well. Now, there's a great article, it's in the references for this, this talk, um, about 10 fonts for architects. And, and type really is, as they say, one of the, the pillars of graphic design. Now, this article was actually translated, so they use the impression of types really to, as the same word as say typefaces or families of type. But they do provide a very good overview of type because they're talking about variations between the letters, you know, light italic and bold, um, upper, lowercase, classifications, serif or sans serif. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. In other words, there's a whole wide world of type, but even more so, even when you narrow it down to a couple of fonts, you've got to think about the hierarchies. So you want to have a big, bold title for your portfolio, for example. You may even want to add a graphic effect. Um, I'm going to talk about color in a moment, but I do want you to note that's just a simple navy blue background, the same color, but look at how it changes, whether it's on that, the dark side, the, the left side, or the right side of the screen. It almost seems as if it's got its own gradation. But then you'll also wanna have a section heading, you know, like here's my design work, a subheadings for overviews, and text that describes the, the piece of the section. And typically, um, I, I, serif faces like this, Garamond is easier to read in the body of the text. And you may even have things for caption and figures and, um, and other sorts of tables. So think about all of your text in a kind of a hierarchy. Now, if in doubt, fall back on the classic typefaces. Now, here's where we talk about what a serif or sans serif face is. Basically, a serif face has these little caps or pieces on the end of the, the letters. Interestingly enough, the reason for that is that when we used to set type in lead, little pieces of lead, those pieces would break if there was as thin as that stem of the end. So they put these little pieces on the end of the lead type so that they would be sturdier and they persisted to this day. But you can't go too far wrong with these fonts. Um, the, the same article I was mentioning, they list all of these other fonts. I didn't have them all, so I'm, I tried to show the ones that I did have, but I don't have Bauhaus or Neutra or Gotham or Butler or Modica. Some of them I think are a little dicey. Poplar doesn't look like a, a font that I would use, but um, you should have a look at that article too if you're interested in type. Now, another thing that you've got to think about is the type going to be justified or unjustified. So here we have a, a set of type. You don't need to worry about what it is because we'll talk about what it is later, but it's what we call left justified because everything is flush along the left edge. But here it is when we, justify it like this. So sometimes justified type looks really good because you get this good rectangle. Here it looks kind of bad because it's got too much space between the words. So you have to think carefully about that. But here's one thing, 
as somebody who's now 65 years old and whose eyesight is failing, always, I hope, um, I hope very, very few of you can read this, but what it says is always make sure that the text is large enough so that anyone can read it. And so if you've got text on one of your drawings, make sure it's legible because there's nothing more annoying or irritating is there's something that the type is so small that you can't actually read it. And sometimes that happens when you shrink down a drawing. So be careful about that one. Um, if you want to go further, uh, I went all the way back to 1931. Eric Gill, who, who did one of the typefaces I talked about, in fact, he did that typeface back in the 1930s for the London Underground. And if you go there today, you'll still see it. It actually used to be part of the Toronto subway system as well, but it's a great art. Uh, this is really, he, he gets into type, ornamental type and other kinds of things. So it's very, very interesting essay. Color. Um, if you're not good with color, and I'm not good with color, so if I want to create a color palette, you can go online to a place like ColorMine. And you can quickly, just by pressing that generate button, generate all sorts of color patterns, color palettes of things that work pretty well together. Uh, so think carefully about your colors and how they all work together. And if you want to go further, one of the best books on the topic is The Secret Lives of Color. It's, this is a wonderful, thick book um, that talks in depth about all the different kinds of colors. Um, want to go further? This book as well I found interesting on color for architects. Now in terms of layout, again, let's go back. I was showing this slide earlier, but what you want to do is you want things to line up. And you can see how it forms a kind of a rectangle of type and things, and you're sort of just suggesting how all of these things work together. So really, once you get a set of guides like those red lines, make them work on every page. So one of my, uh, I have a good friend here in the Valley called Robert McDonald, who's one of Canada's, I think, best graphic designers, particularly for books and magazines. And he runs a, a session, um, a series of lectures in town. And we were doing one on design and we, um, he came up with this poster, the image, I, I created the image, um, but he used a single font, Garamont. He used, uh, there's only five colors at work on this poster. Uh, in particular, the background image was originally a 3D model that I created, but I took it into Photoshop. And then I used a gradient map. And a gradient map simply reduces everything to two colors. In this case, that kind of purple and the orange. And then uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple design, but it's a pretty effective one. And again, you can see how everything starts to line up. And there's um, these tiny thin lines, which are called rules, R-U-L-E, -R um, that are used to define things. And you'll see a couple of uses of that in, in different places. Um, so when you're doing layout, I had to do a, a quick basic portfolio of things. And so I, I, I'm not good in InDesign, so I just did this in Word. So that we'll talk about tools in a second, but Again, even in Word, you can start to do these layouts. Um, here, I put a background behind the title type in order to sort of make it pop out. Um, and sometimes when you're doing layout, um, yes, you have to actually stretch images or crop them. Better to crop them, but sometimes I stretch images so that they'll fit, or sometimes I squeeze them so that they'll fit within the format that I'm trying to establish. And if you do that not too much, you can get away with it. Again, using a simple rule uh, just to define the bottom of the page. If you want to go further, this book, The Non-Designer's Design Book, is, is a particularly good one. And it has this wonderful thing. Uh, it's, it calls its sort of theory of graphic design crap for contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. So we'll see some very contrasting things because that makes things pop out. Um, Repetition of graphic elements to tie the whole thing together. Alignment we've talked about and putting things in proximity or close to each other that are related. The other thing though, I put this slide in because it's sometimes it's important to think about the blank space as well. So if you try and pack too much onto a page, sometimes it'll just get overwhelming. So think about your blank space too. Um, a little bit of, about content. And I do wanna share with some of these things with you. I, about 10 years ago, I asked various um, professors of architecture what they looked for in portfolios. And I got a number of good responses. And this one is about, you know, your creative and graphic work, illustrate your skills and interests, and show us how you organize your ideas. 
So there's going to be a theme through these things about creativity. So here they're asking for us uh, samples of design work, creative activities such as freehand drawing, architectural drawing, painting, sculpture, photography, and so on. And this is the most important one. Um, we are much more interested in work that expresses your creativity and provides evidence of imagination and curiosity about the world. And that's really kind of important. And the same things we were hearing from Waterloo, the purpose of a portfolio is to demonstrate both personal depth and ability. So here they're saying, you know, photorealistic photo art renderings of photographs, which you people may have done in high school or secondary school, have limited relevance. So you've got to be careful what you, you choose to put into your portfolio. Um, and, and again, here we see coherent bodies of independent work tend to be more valuable than school assignments. That's a pretty important thing to remember. And finally, hand drawing and journal keeping, especially related to thoughtful, reflective observation of the built and natural environment, remain excellent evidence of a candidate's interior life. So, armed with this information, how do you organize your portfolio? Well, the best ones tell a story. So it, all stories have a beginning and an end. And it's just like, if you've ever played music and you're doing a set list, you, you sort of put your, your weak and your strong numbers, alternate them so that you don't get a block of, of things that might be considered weaker. And, but pick images and present them in a dramatic manner that will make people pay attention. And of course, well, there's a huge number of, of software tools out there. Um, uh, you, can, you can use all sorts of things in order to build your portfolio. Um, a couple of personal preferences though, um, I would say Revit's not the best tool for doing your modeling in because it tends to sometimes constrain your creativity. What we're seeing in rendering is uh, Enscape is an incredibly powerful tool which is free for students. And again, sadly, some of the Adobe suite of tools like Illustrator, Photoshop, and InDesign, they almost have uh, predatory pricing where you have to do a subscription and pay for a full year. And that's, I find that kind of sad that there's no real inexpensive student versions. But there are free alternatives like GIMP if you need to do image processing. But now let's talk a little bit about how it composes with, you know, putting a document together. Pick a dramatic cover image. This is the one, one of the most dramatic Im images I've seen. It's very well done, uh, rendered in, in V-Ray with post-production in Photoshop and Topaz. Both are image processing um, software. So, if you can hit people with something dramatic at the start of your portfolio, they're going to pay attention. But as we saw, you know, hand drawings and sketches are also important, but there's ways that you can pump them up. Sab does some beautiful drawings and really understand, starts to understand the line weights and things that are happening. Um, but then he took one of his drawings and he, he basically reversed it, put a bit of a blue tone on it to make it even more dramatic. And that's important. So, what pe what people have said to me is you know there's and i want to point out there's nothing wrong with this autocad floor plan absolutely nothing wrong it's a it's a great working drawing but you don't want to include too many of these kinds of things in your portfolio you know you may have reams and reams of working drawings but try not to focus on those things because um it doesn't really pop off the page and this kind of thing will have visitor fatigue, I would say, or reviewer fatigue very quickly. Because instead, instead of this, you could do something like this. This is a shadow plan that we developed, actually did it before computers for a competition that we entered. And uh, you, you can see, you know, the drama between this or this is quite profound. Similarly, this is a section and there's nothing wrong with this section. It's a, it's a good working drawing. But Isosaki, when he was doing this uh, Brooklyn Museum, he hired a silkscreen artist to make these beautiful shadow sections. Now today, we can do something similar quite easily with, with different kinds of uh, 3D modeling software. So these are the kinds of things you want to make your plans and sections really pop. Then, this is a, a, a piece by uh, Nicholas Renfer um, in his portfolio. Again, he was kind enough to let me use it. And what a dramatic shot, what a dramatic perspective. So simply by altering the perspective, you can get these very powerful effects. But the other, the nice touches, the birds in the sky and the contrails, great, great stuff. Um, 
and sky makes a difference. So think about the skies. So I was working on this one drawing for something I was you know, doing and I put, put a photograph of the site in the background, but then I wanted to try and play around with it and, and make a night shot. And this kind of made some interesting new textures on it. But then I found a, I simply added a, a star background to it. And of course the stars don't look like that where I live, I wish they did, uh, but it certainly adds drama to it. And again, it's about storytelling. So here's another um, uh, rendering by Nicholas. And this speaks of Canada. I mean, it's even got the, the tire tracks in the snow. You can tell this is a building that's you know, showing things in their natural environment and climate can be very powerful. And this is a particularly good one. Um, I do want to point out, sometimes when you have to put type on a drawing, it's the wrong color. And so to be consistent, sometimes you can put a bit of a drop shadow underneath the type so it's still legible. But continuing on with the vein of storytelling, Salam Yosef did this beautiful rendering in SketchUp and then into Enscape. And I was blown away. I hadn't heard of Enscape before. And when I saw this, I thought, wow. But she's done it so carefully. You can tell by the colors and you can tell by the hangings and you can tell by the people running around and the size of the furniture, this is a space for children. It sort of explains itself. And that's a very, um, that's a very nice way to work a rendering. Now, um, I know that Henry's going to show a little bit of Brendan Webb's portfolio, but we were very impressed with Brendan's work. Um, and he, um, he was kind enough to share it with us. Look how the gradient background works across here, how he's used a shadow plan here, how he's included a north arrow, and uh, he's using these color stripes to connect the elements. And uh, also he's worked his name and the page number in there. All of these are essential elements. This is a very um, expertly composed page. Now I saw that Henry's gonna talk about this one, but it's just another element from Brendan's work. And Brendan was kind enough to give a lecture on this. Um, oh God, it was only last March. It seems like years and years ago, but it's available on our, our YouTube channel. So almost at the end here, the things to include, well, some of this is basic, but almost make a checklist to make sure all of your, all of your portfolios have a table of contents, have page numbers and scales and north arrows. And it's very important if you worked on a group project to make sure that people know what your role was and the names of your collaborators and references if you have them. So things to remember, tell a story, keep it simple but dramatic, and consider every aspect of the design. And um, these are some of the references that I had in there. And it's important to put the references and do them properly. But I wanted to last of all to share with you this, this last piece about a rendering. This is a is, is Frank Lloyd Wright's rendering of the interior of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And it's, a, it's such a great story. So he did this rendering and you can see he's, he was brilliant in pencil crayons. You can see how the intensity of the color and the thing that painting or whatever it is, we're supposed to be focused on, even to the extent that the ones on the left and on the right are much more faded out. But he did this, I've got a massive helicopter flying over at the moment. So that's what you hear in the background. He did this and then he wrote the title, The Masterpiece. And I think at that point he, he realized, he, he, this was a, a man with a colossal ego, of course, and, and just as a joke at himself, after he'd done everything else, he added the little girl with the yo-yo and it changes the picture completely. It almost as if he's mocking himself because in terms of this marvelous museum, in terms of this masterpiece painting, uh, she couldn't care less. She's actually just playing with her, her yo-yo. And that's not a bad, it, it tells such a great story um, that I wanted to share that with you at the end. And that is the end for me. And I, I, wanted, um, I know we're, uh, we want to make sure we stay on time. So I'm going to stop sharing it and hand it over to the next speaker. But thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Douglas, for that uh, presentation. Very informative. Um, I'm personally interested in font these days, so I'm going to check out your resources. Um, so uh, next up, um, we have Rudolph, who's going to be presenting. So Rudolph, I'll invite you to share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Let me just get it up quickly. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I think right off the bat, it's important to note that I teach at a technical university. So my slant on uh, the portfolio and the design portfolio is very much trying to communicate uh, a depth of technological knowledge. 
uh, we've just done our year in moderation. So I'm going to use examples from, uh, from one of my students, uh, Graham de Vernon. Let's see if I can get this slide to, to move now. There we go. So uh, just a, a note or two to, before we get to the graphics. Um, the work that I'm going to show includes concept design through to technological detailing. Um, it's a multimedia approach employing a variety of skills. So you also want to show off all the different types of skills that you've uh, gathered and developed during your studies. Uh, so our students generally combine physical models, hand drawings, and then computer drafting and modeling. Um, don't focus on one particular skill alone. So don't only focus on design, rather think of the type of work you'll be required to do in practice and showcase your ability to do that. I think for us at uh, the University of Technology, um, we've got a traditional university uh, in Cape Town as well, and we try and get our students to really let their uh, unique selling point of their technological knowledge uh, shine through. Rudolph, so you. you know that uh, your slides are not in full screen yet. Oh, goodness. Um, I thought something was bound to go wrong. Uh, let me just see. I think I'm, uh, if, if they are visible and you can just see the little browser, I'm going to keep them like that because I don't know how to, uh, to get it on a full screen without losing my, my own notes. So what I'm going to take you uh, through firstly is two projects from, from this basically design presentation. Um, so the first was precedent analysis, uh, something which we try and communicate uh, very clearly the fact that students have the ability to, to understand precedent, to gather the correct type of precedent, and then very importantly to to uh, put that in, in your own hand, to draw and diagram this. And you can see on the left-hand side how this was done, uh, looking at uh, the types of functions in this particular building. And then also to include process work, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side. And I think that it's very important to find a way of including these hand drawings, really curating them and selecting the best ones. And also when you do the drawings up front, to know that they might become part of your portfolio because when you com uh, compare them or put them next to computer drawings, you don't want them to, uh, uh, to fall, uh, fall behind by comparison. This uh, next example is taking a hand built cardboard model and then using a photograph, photo montage, layering different colors and folds onto that uh, with hand drawing superimposed onto that. Uh, Douglas made some comments about uh, showing floor plans and so on. And I think this is, a, is for me, is a good example of uh, a balance between communicating the plan as a two-dimensional element and then also including information, not only about the layout by means of the furniture and showing uh, the internal layout, also showing landscape layouts, but also trying to uh, beginning to give a sense of the, the structure and the materiality of the building. And you can see more conventional technical aspects uh, of drawing conventions coming through, such as the grid lines and giving an idea of uh, the climatic design of the facade, louvers and cladding and so on uh, around the top of this drawing. So trying to balance uh, the, the visuals with showing some more technological information without it becoming a working drawing. Same type of representation, just another example. And this one is specifically a ground floor plan and showing how uh, you can integrate the landscape design with your design. So showing furniture layouts, the exterior landscape design and trying to communicate the fact that the, you're not only designing the building, but you're design, designing the entire environment right from, from the roadside adjacent buildings through into your building. This is the same building, just one floor up. I think something which is very important if you're going to present one particular building on different levels is to, to use the idea of fading out uh, the levels below and then also using 
correct conventions to show voids and things above so that for a complicated building it really becomes uh, legible. On the top here we've got a presentation banner which this particular student used uh, actually on the front page. So trying to create a visual identity for the presentation before you launch into, uh, into the rest of the presentation. You can see some of the, uh, some of the highlights of the building from, based on, on the, I think this was a Revit model uh, being used as part of this banner. And also uh, the way in which the text in the hierarchy and the sizes were selected. Then um, at the bottom, the Northwest elevation, it's an existing building at the bottom and then a new building straddling that. And you can see how the existing building is punched back a bit and the new building really jumps out at you. Also, uh, using the model as a base and really focusing on, in this instance, the, the climate screen for what is a northwest elevation. So in our hemisphere, that's your late afternoon sun and a lot of attention in this design went into the passive design of the facade. So really drawing focus to, uh, to that aspect of the design. Then moving into the more technical drawings, uh, a, a design section, uh, giving a sense of, of the, the structure of the building. This is a concrete frame building. And then very, a very strong idea of the interior of the building with the ghost detail in the background. Once again, also faded out so that it doesn't uh, compete too much with what is being cut through. So that the drawing still as a, as a technical section uh, performs well. And then in this case, also incorporating a lot of landscape information uh, flowing down from the left-hand side of this section. This is exactly the same portion of the building and you can see clearly here the distinction between a presentation drawing and a technical drawing and, and for our students we encourage them to put a select number of technical drawings uh, in their portfolios as well. But you can see if I scroll back that although it's the same portion of the building it really draws attention to different aspects of the design. This part of the drawing showing off technical proficiency, the ability to, to function uh, in the production side of an office. And then uh, the inevitable big 3D uh, drawing that, that we get in every presentation, and then using uh, some strategies that Douglas also spoke about, uh, but textures, fills, uh, vegetation, people, to really liven up the drawing. Once again, moving more into the realm of the technological, uh, using color on a, on a technical drawing on the left-hand side, which really helps uh, the drawing to become much more legible than what it would have been uh, as, a, as a black and white drawing. So uh, two functions really with this uh, use of color to firstly make it more legible and then to make it more visually appealing as part of a presentation. And then moving into a combination of three-dimensional and two-dimensional uh, more technological explorations of portions of the building. And then to, to round off uh, using a wireframe or a computer model and then layering certain aspects of information onto that. In this instance, uh, it's a services integration layout, which you can very clearly read uh, the, the, the spatial aspects of the building. And then by virtue of, of the use of color and the legend, very easily get a sense of uh, how the technical services are integrated into this building. Uh, so this presentation very much biased towards uh, showing off technological skill as part of a portfolio. I think that uh, Veronica is, is my, my presentation. Great, thank you Rudolf. Um, next we have Karen, did you want to share next? Um, I do. Um... Good morning, everyone. Give me a minute. I'll go to full screen here. Can everybody see the screen okay? Great. Um, hi, everyone. It's wonderful to see um, so many of you from all over the world. Um, that's great. Uh, so for today, I, um, I thought I'd share something that we've done um, with our students in the San Francisco Bay Area um, uh, this summer. Of course, uh, you know, given what's happening this year, all of this was done on Zoom. Um, so, you know, I, uh, you know, so there are a lot of uh, really great advice was already shared. Um, so I'm going to actually 
kind of give a little bit of context um, for uh, what um, what I want to share with you. So basically, I wanted to focus on or share with you um, what um, some of these architects. So we had a chance to invite 20 or so architects um, to uh, work with our students this summer and what they have said. And it was really um, affirming and remarkable how consistent their messaging was. Um, and so this, this event um, is something that we do every year to support students who are specifically transitioning from school to practice. So, uh, you know, internships, uh, you know, getting jobs out of, uh, upon graduation. So uh, they're all, so it's not so much geared uh, for graduate school applications or other kinds of applications, but it's really about getting a job. So this summer, um, given the pandemic, um, the hiring uh, landscape, especially in the Bay Area, dramatically changed. Um, so when, so we shut down in, the, in March um, and we first had just had no information, you know, how are the different firms doing, who's hiring. Um, so we um, kind of expanded on what we, uh, this kind of a, this, uh, you know, a couple session um, event, uh, work series of workshops that had been in the past years, so we expanded it, you know, so it went on steroids. Um, and we really um, kind of saw it as an opportunity to um, provide mentorship uh, relationships, you know, so connecting, um, being the bridge between the architects in practice and with some of our students who are, um, you know, with had a lot of anxiety. And what we found was, was um, really incredible. Um, the overwhelming response that we got from the, the, pra the practitioners was that um, they everybody remembered the last, re the, actually some of them remembered multiple past recessions and how uh, how that decimated um, the, the young architects who uh, couldn't enter the profession, chose not to uh, because the jobs weren't there or the, the mentorship, uh, they didn't find it. And so now, you know, many of these um, architects are leaders in their firms and they're feeling that effect, right? So they're having a tough time hiring somebody with 10 years of experience, right, due to the uh, 2008 recession. And so, you know, we heard um, a unanimous um, kind of, you know, sentiment from, you know, architects from all over the, in different firms that they really wanted to um, send a really strong message to the students who are leaving school that, you know, it's not just about um, so even the things, some of the firms, things look bleak, um, they wanted to really uh, encourage them to keep trying to reach out to architects, you know, to seek that mentorship. Um, so because they understood that it's, you know, good for the profession, right? So it's not just about, you know, firm to warm uh, health. So there was an event, um, you know, so many several Zoom sessions held like this over the summer. Um, so preceding um, the per, our own portfolio review and practice interview. So, you know, we prepped the students with um, about how, you know, how to organize their portfolios, um, gave some tips and advice. Um, but basically it came, comes down to, you know, maybe these, what are these six things? Um, so first and foremost, uh, what we've told the students and what we heard um, back from the architects again and again is they want to know who you are. Um, so of course the portfolio needs to cover the basics. It needs to show your strengths, your skills, um, you know, um, uh, you know, what you do well, um, but first and foremost, they want to understand, um, you know, who are you, right? So, you know, so if you can imagine, these are practitioners, and so, you know, upon hiring, you would be uh, joining that team, and so, you know, whether uh, for large and small firms, you know, that uh, you know, that interpersonal dynamic is really important, right? So in addition to making sure that you're qualified for the position, they want to kind of envision you in the office, you know, working with the teams and how, you know, um, how your strengths and weaknesses or your personality would mesh with the team. So that's really the strongest message that we heard, um, that uh, the portfolio shouldn't be generic. You know, there should be really um, a lot of, um, you know, you as a person, right? Um, so, you know, kind of a, not just as, you know, somebody who is skilled at something, but, you know, as a, as a person who's, you know, spent a number of years in the, uh, you know, training to be an architect, training to be a designer, you know, how you see the world, you know, what values you've developed um, along the way, you know, that are important to you, how, uh, how you see your, your uh, kind of um, trajectory in the, in the professional career path, you know, what value that you hope to bring, you know, with your um, practice in architecture, 
Um, so really that was the, the strongest message. And I think often, uh, especially for our, some of our kind of younger students, um, that was a little bit of a surprise that, you know, they were so um, concerned about, well, you know, I don't know this software that well, or, you know, I don't, I don't know that other skill, you know, I don't have that other skill as, um, you know, don't have it down quite yet. And so they were very worried about making sure that the portfolio featured all of those kind of uh, skills. Um, but the, at the end of the day, right, so what I should say is that, you know, eventually all students get there. They all learn the skills. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you um, kind of flip, um, put yourself in the position of the person who's screening those portfolios, um, you know, you're, everybody knows, like, you know, so, uh, you know, Doug shared the list of, you know, softwares that he recommends. Everybody is using the same software, right? So if your portfolio looks like a certain software, then you kind of recede into the background, right? It looks very generic. And so you really want to find your own kind of take on, you know, whether it's a, you know, a kind of a mood, right? Uh, that, you know, set by the color palette in your portfolio or something kind of witty or funny or quirky, right? Um, but kind of you really want to, find um, you know something different or something that is unique about you and figure out a way to translate that into a visual language in your portfolio. Um, okay so here's some some quotes. Um, uh, so there, I think I have about four or five of these. Um, so a lot of um, what Doug has mentioned already, the first thing they look for, right? Um, so some uh, is a visual hierarchy, right? So are you somebody who is adept at organizing visual information, right? That in a way that's clear, that there's a clear hierarchy, it's really easy to follow. Um, and, you know, some, <clears throat> I think, you know, so now in the uh, so especially now, but even before, you know, most of the submissions um, for open positions are through some kind of a web portal or, you know, e your, your portfolio is emailed, uh, you know, as a PDF. And so it's really important to um, kind of, um, again, imagine the audience and imagine the experience of the audience um, and understand that it's all going to be seen on a screen, right? So how you paginate the um, the PDF file, right, um, you can, you want to kind of really test it um, so that when the recipient opens the file, it opens in the way that you want. And some notes about, you know, page numbers, um, you know, th this varies. Uh, this was, you know, a quote from one of the, you know, one person, one architect. Um, but, you know, basically the, um, uh, the consensus was that if it's really good, <laughs> they're going to go past the 30 or 40 pages. If it's redundant and if it's, you know, not laid out in a, uh, in a clear way, they're going to stop after five pages. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the, the, the number of pages when they open the PDF file, that also makes an impression. Um, so, you know, uh, and they'll talk about editing in a second, but, you know, it's, um, it's really important to balance, um, you know, white space. So, so you, you don't want to cram things. Um, so, you know, white space, pacing, um, right? So you don't want every page to be so dense that, you know, we lose visual focus. Um, to balance that, um, you know, with the number of pages. So editing is really key. Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Yes. Um, so, you know, so hence, you know, we get to this first quote. So it's really heartbreaking <laughs> because in studio um, and in your other classes, you uh, work so hard, you know, you spend so much time, you know, create, you know, creating all the drawings and uh, models and images, but just because you have it doesn't mean it should go in your portfolio, um, especially if it, um, you know, makes that flow uh, break or if it, you know, appears redundant. Um, so these are some of the uh, kind of, you know, criteria that, you know, uh, that they've recommended that students used to decide, right? So, um, so does it actually tell the story of the project or is it just a nice image that you fell in love with, right? So that's a hard cut. Um, and they, they also um, look at how you edit and curate your own work because that ability to prioritize is a professional skill, right? So they see it as, a, as an indication of how you would pr prioritize your time, you know, if you were, you know, if you were to join that firm and, you know, work within that team. Um, and again, you know, so, you know, you have to be really, really critical and, um, uh, you know, uh, be very uh, almost harsh with yourself, uh, right? So if the drawing isn't doing its job, it's, if it isn't showing what it's meant to show, then um, try it without it, uh, right? You can always add things back. 
in white space. Uh, I hope, hopefully that message is coming across or you're hearing it from multiple channels. There's, there's really nothing, uh, in my opinion, nothing more uh, you know, important than white space um, when putting together your portfolio. Um, so you want to be conscious about, you know, where the white space is on every single page, right? How much white space, um, you know, what that, um, that, again, that rhythm and pace is. Um, and then telling the stories. Um, so this is where, um, the, you know, they're trying to get to get p uh, past the kind of the, you know, just the technical skills or checking the boxes, right, that, um, uh, in other words, the, the list of qualifications that perhaps are, you know, listed, you know, in that um, job uh, posting description. So they're, they're trying to get past that, right? So. Um, so this is in the, um, right, so they're trying to kind of get a sense of who you are as a person first, um, and then to see how you tell the story of your projects, um, right? Um, you know, so, you know, I think this is a really good um, uh, opportunity for the students to, um, you know, convey, you know, so I think in each of the, the design studio projects, especially it really is, you know, our blood and sweat. And so to really connect with, you know, why you were so passionate and what you loved about that particular project and really speak to that, you know, speak from that place. Um, and uh, in, even as you're laying out the projects, right? So always think about, you know, um, you know, look, look at your own project from the perspective of that, you know, that receiver, the portfolio reviewer. Uh, and then, um, so this is another, the last quote, you know, annotation. Um, this is, again, something we heard over and over and over again. Um, you know, so we, because you, you are so familiar with your own projects, you know, there are um, drawings and, you know, diagrams that um, for you don't need the labeling or for you don't need uh, the, the caption that describes why it's there or what it's doing or how it's part of the, the whole story of the project. Um, but for somebody who's scanning your portfolio, you know, initially, you know, within, um, you know, a few seconds, if not a few minutes, um, you know, the, it's really critical to, um, you know, go the extra mile and put in the extra work uh, and place uh, an annotation, you know, below so not somewhere else footnoted, but right there next to the image for every image, right? So, you know, in other words, you know, we are, as you all already know, like we're all, you know, uh, architects, you know, process uh, visual information very quickly. Um, and if the little piece of caption or annotation below that image is going to help us um, so that we can pick up a few keywords so that as we scan it really fast, we can kind of form a mental image of, you know, what it is that you were trying to do in that project. Um, it's going to leave an impression rather than, you know, so as opposed to, oh, here's a series of really pretty images, but I'm not sure why they're here. Um, and then clarity, so this is critical thinking, um, you know, so that's, uh, so in addition to the kind of the technical skills or software skills, it's really the thinking that I think differentiates the, the successful candidate from those who are not. Um, so the thought process um, in the way that you organize the portfolio, but also in the way that you tell the story of the project, right? You know, tell, um, <clears throat> you know, highlight the aspects of the project. Um, so, you know, how you uh, d begin with uh, an idea in the beginning of the project and how you develop that, um, you know, that uh, is also what they're looking for. Um, so it's really important to explain the process, not just the final product. Um, and, but of course, you know, it, it needs to be, um, both so the technical skills are just as important so you know if we if you just have really amazing critical thinking skills but without you know not the technical skills that's also problematic so it really needs to be both the technical skills and the critical thinking skills um, and this is something that um, so in the middle quote the, about the great floor sections uh, uh, plans and details um, you know, so I think, you know, so there are uh, some of these rendering software that are so powerful nowadays um, and are so easy to use. Um, they, they, they create, you know, they produce, you know, wonderful looking images, but you have to remember everybody access access to that, right? Everybody can use Unscape, everybody can use Twinmotion. And so um, I think it's important to again, remember that, you know, even if it, you, 
uh, even if it's new to you and you know you're in love with the images that it gives you you have to remember the person who's receiving this is seeing them over and over and over again and so if you have a great you know technical drawings right plans and sections and details that really um, signals to the reviewer that you've um, kind of you know sat down and dug deep and figured out how a building goes together you know that's a big plus um, so you know we're hearing that they're not seeing that as much anymore Okay, so I think that's the end of my slides. That's great. Thanks, Karen. Um, so next up we have um, Francesco. Hi, um, thanks. Veronica, I'm sharing my screen now, which I think is this one, so I should be all right. Uh, thanks. Uh, so my presentation um, will focus on a dual aspect uh, of the folio, which we create the curtain. Uh, and so I will try to speak about portfolio as a critical reflection in preparation of your presentation and introduction to industry. Uh, first, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the elders and custodians of the wider Kingo nation, past and present, their descendant and kin. As a representative of Curtin University, I'm proud to honor the younger people and the value and value of this place. Share learning where I work, travel, and live, and we're uh, presenting um, to you um, tonight. Uh, place is important, and I think that uh, looking at the previous presentations in the introduction uh, by by Douglas, it, it comes to my mind the fact that. Um, it is important to uh, recognize that we share common ground, we share a common language, uh, the language of architecture, so we want to be precise and, and absolutely sharp in, in, in our communication, and that's why we need to understand this language, experiment with it, and, and find our own way of expression within a set of rules. That, that is an essential component. It is, it is also true that uh, every, every place has a particular context to which uh, we speak um, in terms of peoples and communities, uh, even in professional work. Um, and so I will try to explain briefly how do we approach portfolio at Curtin in our undergrad and postgrad courses um, as we try to build the, cap the cap capability of students to actually express themselves. Um, more and more autonomously uh, through the course. So we actually ask them to produce a portfolio for every design that they, that they actually uh, produce, uh, not just a final presentation, but a sort of reflective portfolio. Um, our course is decided in four streams, and we have one of the streams, the method stream, that is focusing on learning skills, learning the graphics, learning softwares, but also um, exploring these techniques with a purpose uh, of telling um, of telling a story and essentially we want uh, students to be uh, of course competent in in, uh, in, the, in their expression their graphic and visual analysis in modeling graphic representation but also we want them to uh, learn how to select uh, what they want to use and how and this goes from graphics to colors to materials to 3D printing rather than um, rather than uh, 3D modeling and visual and advanced visualization, uh, trying to set their own palette uh, to express ideas according to the project that they are that they're studying. Um, in uh, in the undergrad, what we do, we focus on their basic skills, and we actually give them. Uh, a very, very defined brief most of time. So we introduce them to what the folio is. Uh, so it is at the end of the process of design actually is a, is a moment where you have the opportunity to recollect your ideas and, 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 and see not only uh, uh, and seek not only the way to tell the story of the project, but also to tell the story of your journey through the process. Um, because this, we believe, is enabling you to actually reflect more on why did you choose a particular way to, to, to um, produce um, your design and present your design in, uh, in a particular way. So at the beginning, we try to have students giving them uh, also a very boring set of uh, instructions, if you like, or, or points of references uh, from which they can they can um, they can select how to proceed. Um, this is an example from a, a student from the undergrad, Shoban uh, Green, who actually they produce a real booklet uh, out of the uh, out of the work that she produced for design. And of course, <coughs> we want them to be 
Uh, we want our students to be confident in what they do, but we also want them to explore how a technical drawing can become, I think Douglas and, and my colleagues have already touched upon this, how a technical drawing can become more expressive of other aspects that embed intangible values of architecture. This is one of the things that we want them to focus on, uh, how you transfer your ideas, your values, your ethos, um, your beliefs, uh, you know, in what a space should be, in what an habitation to, should be, for example, in visual communication that is anticipating uh, what the built space uh, would be. So it is very important that you focus your attention, I believe, <coughs> on what you want to say in each page. Um, this is why we offer them the opportunity to actually collect their ideas in a booklet every, in, in every design experience that they make because uh, it is an opportunity for them to say the sentence uh, in each page and actually build a narrative that uh, actually is leading the critics, is leading the guests, is leading the non-expert in the field, depending on who you are talking to, um, through the experience that actually is giving reasoning, uh, reasoning and is giving uh, motivation to what is the uh, definitive uh, design that has been presented uh, as part of the work. So we encourage students to uh, go back and reflect and reframe, um, you know, the work that they have done by selecting and by uh, reorganizing uh, the association of images and models and work that they, they have done. So the folio is actually including, in, in particular in the undergrad, the process work <coughs> as well as the final work. And there is a dialogue that they try to explain also um, uh, using uh, text. We believe that in particularly in the early years, uh, taking advantage of a small text that are actually reflected on the process um, is complementary to the notations that you put on next to uh, more technical uh, documentation. Um, so again, in the in the early years, we tend to give them um, <clears throat> an opportunity to just follow a sort of set of deliverables. Uh, but as a matter of fact. Um, this is more of a common ground for <clears throat> all students to have a safe point of reference. We encourage students to actually be proactive and, and rethink about what they are supposed to present and how to select the work uh, amongst the, uh, all the items that they have produced um, during, the, during the unit. We call courses unit actually, and we call uh, um, the program, we call it the course, so you might uh, hear me um, referring to units rather than, than, than courses um, in this presentation. Um, another important part are the diagrams, uh, the conceptualization of what they do, <clears throat> which is always a good way to explain through images rather than text, or if you like, it's really a visual text. Um, it is a way to explain uh, uh, how uh, the uh, spatiality, the the, the elements of the design have been composed together and they come to make sense in a particular um, uh, house composition or building composition. Um, the graphics, of course, play a very um, multiple uh, set of functions. So in this case, you can see how the page is organized in such a way that the contrast between the black and the white is also recalling the ground that is then hosting the plants from which uh, the space stems. In, it is in this effort the students actually move from a written reflection to a sort of visual reflection and they're able to communicate concepts. Concepts that we assess so we know in advance, they know in advance that we try to focus our attention on three major elements, technical proficiency, graphic communications, and the process and methods. But the real fil rouge, the real element that links all together is the critical reflection. Um, in the master course, um, we have, again, as you can see, the method stream, the yellow one next to the design stream, they go hand in hand, they are co-requisite units. Uh, and we add a further layer of complexity because in the methods component, we ask them to research more <laughs> about the, the project that they're actually doing. So there is a, a deeper analysis of the site, of the context of precedence, and the philosophy uh, that they want to adopt uh, in their design. Again, the challenge here is to translate all of this um, uh, research into a visual communication. And again, text and images um, uh, go hand in hand in the selection uh, of, the, uh, of the site uh, studies, the selection of the presidents wants to speak uh, 
uh, sort of the same visual language to generate continuity uh, and generate association of meanings between the reading uh, of the plays and the communication of your ideas. So we believe that the folio somehow is the place where the, the communication, the negotiation, the dialogue between the author of the design and the context, uh, the community, the place, um, the time in which you operate uh, can actually be visualized. <clears throat> and for this reason, uh, we definitely uh, reward any visual evidence of critical thinking and ability to interpret plays and people's aspiration that has been transferred into this uh, kind of visual communication. So this is just a set of images that is leading you through the same folio. This is the work of a group of students. I've selected some images by uh, Ben Stevens and Ashdeo Tatia. did a great work here. This was a big challenge. This is a unit uh, that's called Urban Design, in which collecting the uh, narrative about a large scale project is probably one of the most difficult tasks the students uh, have to, to, um, <coughs> um, to in, uh, interact with uh, before they get to thesis and actually complete their folio. So the next presentation, we'll have a few students from Curtin who will present their final folio, what they, they collect together after the five years of study uh, at Curtin. And that is really the transition into the um, into industries, their business card. But uh, my, my communication to you is really about um, how we try to build these abilities step by step, incrementing complexity and scaffolding content uh, of the folio and the aspiration that the folio uh, should have uh, year after year. And of course, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the selection of, uh, of representation this, uh, it can, can, can refer also to visual maps from, uh, from historic research and it needs to echo uh, in, the, uh, in the way the, the graphics and, and the language actually uh, recollect the memory of places and transfer these into, um, into, into the proposal. Uh, every team of students does this in a very personal way, so it's always an open-ended experiment. You know, we share a common language, but you know, out of seven notes you can write so many uh, music scores um, that there is never one that is very similar to the other and same for poetry and for writing. Well, same for visual language. <laughs> we share the same language, but the, the forms of expression are almost infinite, uh, even though uh, you want to establish clear uh, rules that enable everyone to understand in first impression, the 50 milliseconds rule probably is a golden rule here, um, to understand exactly where you're heading uh, with information. You will notice that in these two presentations, the use of color has been limited. This is something that I personally tend to probably a little bit cruel with my students at the beginning because I tend to constrain them into a very, very restricted palette. Uh, and then they can <clears throat> liberate themselves or find in particular pages of the folio um, the opportunity to actually go back to color, which is uh, a celebration of materials, a celebration of nature, a celebration of, of the plasticity of the, uh, of the work, um, which uh, regains value and is a sort of a very, very uh, selected uh, use uh, of, of colors with the idea to um, actually focus the attention on that particular aspect of the project. So <clears throat> sometimes color can be used, of course, to clarify a set of plans um, as has been uh, described in, in different presentations. But I think that uh, in, in this one, I wanted really to focus on the narrative that is a double, a two-fold narrative. The narrative of the project, the images, but also the narrative of students who actually reflect on what they're doing and refine further and further in this process that steps from uh, year to year. Uh, towards the uh, preparation of their professional portfolio uh, when they graduate. Um, I think I'm going to stop here because I would really love to um, uh, leave space for, for discussion. So uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Francesco. And our, our last presentation uh, will be from Henry. Um, so whenever you're ready, Henry.
Great. Do you see my slides? Yep. Well, uh, thank you for uh, everyone's uh, presentations. I'm uh, going last, so I think I'm going to be presenting a lot of um, uh, probably redundant information, but probably also echoing a lot of my colleagues of what you're saying, and ho hopefully summarize a lot of the points that we've covered already. Um, so I'm going to be quick. Um, five tips for making a winning portfolio. So my presentation focuses on um, students who are in a bachelor's program entering a, a graduate school program. So mainly because uh, in the context of time, um, a lot of universities in Canada and the US uh, are accepting uh, portfolios now and the deadlines are this month and next month. So we, we wanted to give this presentation on portfolios today to help students um, um, edit or to improve their portfolios uh, to apply for master's degree. So I'm not catering directly to the ones who are uh, applying for jobs and I, I'm happy that Karen kind of covered that part um, because I think it's a little bit different in terms of um, the quality of work and also the, uh, the level of technique that you have in those portfolios that are catered to job hunting. Um, so my tip number one, create a memorable impression to survive the flip through. And this is something that I talked uh, to Veronica about a couple of days ago when we reviewed a student uh, portfolio. And what we kind of agreed is that the first thing that we do when we review student work uh, coming into a graduate program or university program is that we have, let's say, 100 or 200 applications. And the first thing that we do is we separate them in piles. The best pile, the worst pile, and the, one that are, the ones that are in the middle. And it's usually a quick flip through um, to kind of capture the impression of the portfolio. So what I'm trying to say here is that you want to design your portfolio that's so easy to grasp um, your, your whole body of work. Uh, and you want it to give a memorable impression so that we want to come back and look at it more in detail. It's almost like choosing a book from a library. You know, you want to flip through a couple of pages or look at the cover page, and then you want to choose the one that you really want to invest your time in reading. So I think one of the first uh, advice that I have for students is really um, try flipping through your portfolios and see what uh, impression that you have, or ask someone else to look at it and give them uh, give you uh, impressions of what they have, of what um, they feel about your body of work. Um, my, num my tip number two is edit. Um, you are only as good as your worst project. So uh, as uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned is that if you show everything that you've done from year one to, uh, you know, master second year, Obviously, there are some projects you, you will not be very proud of. And most likely than not, uh, reviewers will only will remember your worst project more than your best project. And they will look at your body of work and say, well, this project is kind of iffy. You know, you, if you had the guts to put it into your portfolio, that's probably not a very good choice. So I would edit out your worst projects. And even if some of the schools are asking you to show everything that you've done before, don't be afraid to redesign or rework those projects because nothing is blocking you from reworking projects that you're not very proud of. So look at a spread of all of the works that you are presenting in your portfolio. Choose the ones that you don't like, take them out or redesign them. There's nothing a portfolio can do that will improve your design. It can only highlight your best work. And what we're doing today is really to help you give justice to your best work. But if the project has no content and the design is not good, the only way to solve that is to redesign the project, in my opinion. Okay, so there's no cover-ups. It's really about being transparent and highlighting the best and um, fixing the worst. 
Uh, tip number three, design a narrative. Uh, what are you about and are you a good fit? And I think a lot of my colleagues have talked about this and uh, talked about the story. Uh, what I mean by this is that you'd have to design your portfolio so that we have a good understanding of who you are, what are you about, what do you care about? Is it the environment? Is it people? Is it community? Is it um, you know, anything that is important to you and how does that affect your design? And of course, uh, from the perspective of a, of a university or a firm, are you a good fit to our philosophy or our style of design or our kind of uh, mission in terms of the environment or different types of work that we do? So I kind of like this slide because um, one of our students, Brendan Webb, recently got accepted at the University of Calgary in the master's program. And his portfolio, um, he decided to rename all of his projects so that it was easy to understand what the concept was. So it was not really like elementary school in Calgary or uh, residential building in Edmonton. It was more about um, the, the ideas behind the project that mattered. So I think that's probably a smart way to approach it. I don't think it's the only way, but I think if you, th you need to really think about the story, the narrative, and how do you present it to the reviewers um, so that we grasp what the main points uh, of the project uh, projects are. Tip number four, uh, design process and thinking is, is important. And a lot of my colleagues talked about uh, using simple sketches and diagrams. Um, I really love this slide in particular by Brendan's uh, portfolio because he talks about he has these very simple diagrams that talks about how he developed the design. Um, and he also has uh, the floor plan, which he um, edited so that it pops out, uh, you know, as Douglas had mentioned, uh, using uh, contrasting lines and the importance of using contrast to, to give importance to certain elements and to receive certain elements is very important. Um, here he also has these lines representing uh, sun path diagrams, which I find uh, very interesting. But most importantly, I find uh, important here is the inclusion of people um, in his uh, portfolio, creating a mood. And Douglas had shown some slides showing snowy Canadian winters. But I think what's important here is that it creates a setting, a context, and a mood, which is much more effective than showing just um, rendered uh, boxy things in Enscape. You know, I think the importance here is that we want to see you being able to visualize how people are going to use it. Um, this is these, a slide that I took from my own um, submission to a, a competition uh, uh, for the Calgary Japanese Community Center for the Canadian Architect. And just to show you how simple diagrams can and should be. We need to be able to read them so simply and so quickly that um, they, they are effective to the reviewer. And I, I just want to highlight the use of colors, um, simple colors that can be repeated and be associative um, if we're talking about the same thing. So same things should have the same colors so that we can make that association. This is also another diagram that was um, that I had developed uh, for that project is uh, 16 sections uh, just to explain a shape of a roof, for example, um, using different ways to um, explain something, a, a, a complex shape, for example, um, but using uh, creative ways of showing it so, so that it's so that you make sure that everything that you show in your portfolio is actually informing the design rather than filling space. To number five, places, not spaces. Like I said before, it's much more effective when you have people in your, uh, in your portfolios. We want to see people interacting with the spaces. As you can see here, if you have a classroom or if you have a lounge of some sort, we want to see those people interacting. I think that that gives a lot more dimension to your portfolio and, 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 and it really shows that you understand the architecture. 
Um, another slide here from Brendan's portfolio, again with people, um, diagrams, and also the use of color. Um, the contrast of the colors really make his portfolio pop out. Uh, and, um, you know, Douglas talked about skies, and I think a lot of people talked about skies. I don't think skies have to be always blue. You know, they can be uh, black, red, pink, purple, any color that you want. Um, and as long as you can design that kind of atmosphere around it, and I think you have uh, a range of colors that you can use to really work with the sky. And I think the main point is really that you want to highlight your own architectural project. Um, again, here are some of the renderings. This is a page from my uh, proposal again. Um, don't be afraid to fill up the, the page. If you have a really good rendering uh, of your project, I think it should take up the, sp the space and um, tell the story through the image. An, a, an image is worth a thousand words. So if you have a really good image and you're confident enough to blow it up to the full size of the page, uh, I would say go for it. So what I'm looking for in terms of um, a few points, creativity. Um, when I'm looking at a portfolio, I'm looking for something that I've never seen before. Uh, if you can show me um, drawings, uh, ideas, sketches, um, things, shapes of buildings or use of different materials, anything that can show your creativity. And this also includes non-architectural projects. If you have paintings, sculptures, photography, um, poems, music, anything that can show that you, you, you have a creative side to you, I think that will be a bonus to your portfolio. Personal style and aesthetics. Do you have a personal style in terms of, um, you know, using color or you, we talked about fonts. Are you a more of a classical architect or more of an, a modern architect? You know, those kind of things speaks uh, to your portfolio. Um, do, your, do your designs solve a problem? I think uh, what I'm looking for in a portfolio is whether or not you set the problem or the problematic and the context in your architectural uh, projects. And then does your project actually solve the problem or the context of um, the, the, the building? Um, so those kind of things are shown in your process. Sensitivity, are you sensitive to the context, the culture, um, people, demographics? Are you designing for old people or for children? Um, are you designing in the winter or the summer? Those kind of things also um, make a big difference, I think, in the portfolio. And imagination. Um, I think what I'm looking for in an architectural portfolio also speaks to how well are you able to imagine space. It's not just about drawing maps. Are you able to understand the three-dimensional space and visualize what that will be? And that comes with the moods, the lighting, um, the landscape, and um, all of the factors that affect a quality of a space. And I think that uh, come, uh, comes through in, in a portfolio. So these are the points that I'm looking for. I think uh, all of us who have spoken today have kind of touched upon this and kind of iterated a different way. Uh, but I hope that this summarizes um, some of the main points that I wanted to uh, express today. And then, oh, sorry, one more is a clear process and thinking. I, I, that speaks to the diagrams that I talked about and how do you explain that? Um, Douglas also mentioned that we have a YouTube channel and uh, if you want to learn the whole process of how Brendan had developed his portfolio, um, the one hour uh, session is, is actually online. So if you um, follow our YouTube channel, just type in RAC Center for Architecture and you'll be able to find our channel. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Henry. And thanks to everyone who made presentations today. It was really informative and I hope everyone has found it helpful. Um, we're coming up to um, the end of the session, but um, there's been a lot of great dialogue happening on the uh, chat box already um, with some questions being answered. Um, if everyone has maybe five more minutes to hang on, we can maybe just talk a little bit about it. If you have to leave, no worries. Um, 
But uh, maybe one, the first question is, um, is, you know, who are these portfolios meant for and how do you smoothen out the intersection between technical and gripping visuals, especially when the portfolio is one in hundred, say, at a job interview? So I'll open it up for, um, for either of our speakers to maybe answer. I'm happy to go if you don't mind. Uh, Yes, so please. the calls that we have shown, um, I didn't mention these um, in, in my presentation, but uh, Curtin has a strong uh, tradition of working together with industry. So normally our reviewers are industry guests. So it's a mix of academics and practitioners. So who come every year, first year, second year, third year, fourth and fifth, um, and with different expectations. Um, with the idea to help students to actually engage more and more with professional communication at the end of their design experience. So we tend to set the expectations with them uh, year by year. Um, and so normally is uh, a response to sit certainly they need to demonstrate uh, the academic from an academic perspective that they have achieved the learning outcomes that we that we would like them to uh, work with uh, during their particular term. But um, there is a set of expectations that we uh, discuss with industry in advance. So the communication uh, needs to be somehow professional. Normally, uh, even if we have industry guests, they tend to act also as clients. So they put themselves um, in a position, say, if I were presenting my project to clients, I would love to see this or I would love to see this maybe done differently. So they try to give a double perspective, the, the perspective of professional who might want to hire you because of the quality of your work, but immediately they step into the into the day-to-day -day practice and say, if this was presented to client, maybe the client might have an issue in understanding what you're trying to say here or how you move from this analysis of the site to the proposal, or if there are some particular information that are not meeting with a particular client that is the client of the design brief. So it, I think we try to respond to this double uh, set of questions uh, when our students present their portfolios uh, to industry. Um, I'll, I'll just add something real quick. Uh, to me, the question, um, I think there's two things to consider. Um, one is, you know, who are you sending it to, right? What is it for? If it's for a job, that's a little different than if it's for grad school applications. And then the second, more importantly, it sounds like there's editing, right? And so, you know, if there's a, I mean, of course, um, if there's a technical drawing that really captures um, the, how the idea was resolved, that it should absolutely belong in that in that um, in you know presentation of the project. So it really comes down to you know for each project you know and uh, in thinking about an integrity of that project, right? And so not discriminating uh, between you know design diagrams and technical drawings. It's the you you want to create the whole arc. Hmm. Could I add in um, one of the things that it's looking at the chat box? I know uh, every I thought this was great because everybody kind of presented from a. a almost a different perspective. And I think that's something that everybody should remember. Your portfolio is going to be a living document that evolves over the course of your career. So yes, you have to develop one first to get into a, a master's program, for example. Then you've got to develop one to get uh, going as an intern architect. And then you've got to develop one as um, you know, looking for jobs and uh, trying to get commissions. So the, one of the, the key concepts, though, here is to do your homework. Mm -hmm. So each and every, let's talk about schools, just for example, even in Canada, where we have a modest number of about 12 schools of architecture offering accredited master's program, each one is different. And so you want to try, and I, I was, it was great to see Rudolph's presentation because I realized, yes, different schools are different. They'll be looking for different things. And that's, that's why you want to do your homework know who it is you're going to be submitting your portfolio to and tweak it or craft it or change it in order to um, fit those criteria. And I think that's really important. Yeah. And I'll just one little more thing. So even for a uh, job hunting, internship um, hunting portfolio, you will t tailor them, right? So in other words, you can think of it as, let's say that you have like six projects ready to go, all formatted in the same way, and you would shuffle them or take one out, add something in, depending on the firm that you're applying to. Yeah. 
I, I would suggest that uh, doing a bit of research about the, you know, through the websites or through the work that these practice actually do might help you to refine your narrative. So it is important that you try to, to find out what is the ethos of, of a particular institution or particular uh, office and, and what they focus on. But I will also like to say that you are coming from an, you know, your pathway of education that has its own ethos that you have built together with your institution. Never give up that identity. That would be my suggestion. Be yourself. Don't try to be someone else just because a particular office works in a particular way. They will appreciate the difference. They will appreciate your skills as much as you can be genuine in what you present. So editing is important, but just remember uh, don't don't sacrifice your identity just in name of you know of, of shifting the graphics or a particular way of expressing yourself towards something that you don't feel is is, is belonging to you. So just be yourself. I think that's great uh, discussion. Um, there's a question here that maybe we'll we'll kind of end off on on a, a discussion about because I I often get this a lot too from from uh, people who are putting portfolios together is, what is the best progression for showing your project? And is it best to start with precedent sketches um, or slowly build up or best to capture viewers with a strong rendering? Um, this is often a, a question that people have. So just wondering your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. You know, what I would rec it, I think it depends. Um, I mean, I have a preference, but I think it, you know, the, it depends on the project and depends on the individual. So what I would invite the students to do is see for yourself, like there nowadays with all this um, online um, publishing, you can access so many uh, examples, uh, you know, so be, uh, not just within your schools, but beyond, um, you know, so websites like Lulu, Blurb, um, you know, where, you know, you can just view other architecture students who have put together portfolios and thumb through them and see how you respond, right? So for me, my, uh, my personal preference is that, you know, you really need to grab them first, right? Um, so you, the, especially for job applications, the rule of thumb is they're going to look for every reason to stop reading, right? Or stop turning the pages. That's a rule of thumb. So you got to keep them there. So you want to really draw them in in that opening page with something that, you know, you're most proud of, like your biggest, you know, most, you know, um, engaging drawing, and then explain um, what the process was. Um, if one, Perhaps one, add to what Aaron said is that I, th I think there's a difference between presenting a, a project and, and the sequence of, of logical steps that you would mm -hmm. go through and presenting yourself. And I completely agree that, uh, I mean, it was the first thing that Douglas also mentioned, is that you've got a split second to, to grab someone's attention mm -hmm. and, and then you've either got it or you haven't. So, so the first I would go for, for a, the best representation of your work mm -hmm. and your, your kind of architectural philosophy as a start and, and then build up uh, based on the type of position that you're applying for. Well, yes, uh, I, I, I do agree with that. I would add to it. One lesson that I learned when I started uh, writing my resume and, other, and then I started writing also research papers. Uh, my professor, my PhD supervisor told me, well, just make sure that you compare your first sentence with your last sentence. If they make sense paired together, then it means that the narrative in between probably makes sense. And in some way, probably this is a rule of thumb that you might want to keep for your portfolio because yes, the project is about yourself. It's about presenting yourself, not so much, not so much the single projects next to each other. So just try to build a sort of a narrative. If you feel that you have a follow the progress of evolution of your design skills, uh, just, just uh, mention that in some way, visually possibly rather than, than through writing, but try to find a sort of, a connection between uh, the material that you present so, so that you know the first page and the last page not only are memorable but they also make sense somehow uh, in some way. Mm -hmm. Veronica could I just mention um, I know we have gone over over time um, but if there's uh, and if anybody does have uh, questions that they want to keep on asking uh, uh, anybody who can stay I would be happy to answer questions um, until I, I've got a little bit of time I realize others may not but um, if if we want to go a little longer that would be okay because I think it's really important that students ask as many questions as possible 
absolutely. And, and before uh, anyone has to log off, um, please do um, join us for the next session on January 7th, which we're going to be uh, looking at a number of portfolios. And the idea is, is that um, we'll be sharing, you know, what we see in those portfolios that will hopefully relate to some of the issues that you may be struggling with to help, uh, help you along as well. So uh, we'll send out more instructions about connecting, but hopefully we can just use the same registration link to work uh, into that session. I will on. also share for those of you who may be leaving that um, on January 28th, we're going to be uh, running an equity workshop uh, online um, with uh, Wanda Della Costa, who is the head of the Indigenous Design Center at Arizona State University, uh, together with students from the AEDE, um, Advocates for Equity and Design Education at the University of Calgary will be um, co-presenting a workshop on equity, as I say, and, and uh, I think it'll be very, very interesting and I hope everybody can attend. In fact, I think uh, Francesco and Stephen that it may even relate to the, the studio that you guys are, are doing. So maybe we can integrate these yeah. things as well. Yeah. 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 So, but sorry, that's uh, if, now if anybody who has any questions, please either put them in the chat or there's, a, there's one question here. It says that in terms of creativity, how do you include relevant extra skills in a PDF? Like, uh, if I'm go, uh, like if I'm good in audio presentations and delivering ideas via talking, do I just say I am a good public speaker? Or um, how, so how would you include different types of medium other than visuals like film and, and other aspects like that? Any tips for that? Is this question for Henry or? Um, the chat directed it to Henry, but I'll, I'll open it up to the panelists. Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Um, so it, just in terms of um, incorporating different types of visual or, um, you know, media in a portfolio other than just an image, uh, how would you um, suggest incorporating like film or um, different types of um, artistic medium? Well, that's a good question, though. Um, I think, first of all, it depends on what the instructions the firm or the university is asking for. Some of them asking for most of the time PDFs now. In my time, it was always printed out. So it was very difficult to kind of also, you know, attach a CD-ROM or something like that to the back. But I think now it's a lot easier because now you can include links to your own website or a web portfolio where you can include you know, videos or um, animations or GIFs like that. And I think even in, in, in PDF, you're able to attach um, uh, short videos as well. So I don't think that there's any restrictions to attach those to uh, uh, a PDF, uh, really. Um, but do be careful because the files become very large and sometimes um, university servers don't allow for um, files that are over like 10 megs or something like that. So I think the only danger is that the files become very big when there is um, other medias in PDFs. But otherwise, I don't think um, I would recommend to include links to your own uh, website or, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, portfolio site. I'll piggyback onto that. I saw in the chat something, a question about humor. Absolutely, please. <laughs> you know, I think anything that humanizes you as a person um, is always welcome, right? It, because again, if you have, bring a little bit of empathy, right? Imagine the, the portfolio reader, the reviewer, right? They're going through stacks and stacks and stacks and they have to make piles and, right? And so, you know, something that, um, you know, something that, you know, we start to glaze over, right? So if you can um, inject humor, you know, a sensibility, right? Something that is, um, that you, you know, you feel is, um, you know, accurate, accurate uh, description of you, please, uh, please um, humanize your portfolios. Well, was it a few years ago, I saw an article about, uh, a graduate student who wanted to work for Bjark Ingels. I saw that video. <laughs> right? he, he made a portfolio like a comic book. Uh, oh, okay. I, yeah, I also know of a, a person who made a, a video and rapped in it. <laughs> oh, right. Video and made a portfolio yeah. as a comic book. Uh, same person. To kind of um, fit yeah. with Big's kind of uh, philosophy. Mm. So I think that, that and, and he got the job, right? <laughs> Actually, I don't know. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> to, to speak to the question of other, how do you include other media um, in a, what may only be a visual 
portfolio. Um, just even, even though you can't rely on that anybody would go to a link, as Henry says, including the link at least gives you, um, provides the, the reviewer with some degree of evidence, but other ways that you can do it, if it's a, if it's a thing like the particular one about being a great speaker, if you can have a quote from somebody who said, so-and-so gave the best presentation I've ever seen on the topic of mass timber or something like that, that could be very, that could be useful to include. Um, if you can include links, so you can include, of course, visual representations of you, say, presenting or playing music or whatever it is you do. So a photograph can also work. So there's different ways that you can you can get these different media into the, the portfolio, even if it's totally restricted to sort of a flat two-dimensional kind of approach. There's an interesting question here about portfolios for um, other avenues in in like the architectural field, uh, such as for project managers, and uh, I thought that was a quite unique question. Do you have any kind of suggestions for people who are perhaps applying for um, uh, work as project managers or or other kind of related fields to architecture? Veronica, can I add to that because it's something that I've been wondering about the past couple of minutes. Is I mean. Uh, the relationship between your your uh, your resume or your curriculum vitae and your portfolio you can perhaps just add that to to this question you've now posted uh, posed you know i'll maybe share an anecdote so you know at our um school in our online program um especially in the graduate program you know we have um, students who've had you know a career in something else before so you know in this particular case um, so he was a you know a human resources manager 10 years right and then he uh, changed switch careers um, so though he's new to the profession of architecture his um, skills the people skills in his previous um, a career was essential, right? It, it was a, a key point that he had to get across, but of course it's not visual. So in this case, in the context of a, a job application, that is something that is featured in his um, cover letter and the resume. Yeah, so this goes back to uh, Rudolph's point where, um, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. There's, you know, the resume really provides that overview of, of you know, what you've done in your in your professional life or even in your academic life um, to to accompany the portfolio i think there was a question now in, in the chat that i saw come through about when do you start with your portfolio and i think that it's if i think back to when i started with my portfolio as a student it's very difficult because you you've got limited experience you've got these a uh, handful of projects that you've worked on um, but it, it you, you can afford to be, become more selective as your career progresses. You've got more to work with, which, which is very helpful. And I think it's something, your, both your CV and your portfolio is something that you should update as things come in. Uh, I think that's, that's good practice. Yeah. And I think for, you know, to that, you know, for, um, for the young, you know, students who are new, you know, fairly new in the program, uh, the uh, you know so the portfolio you know could seem may seem a little daunting but archive back up your work save your work every semester or throughout the semester that's one uh, key advice I'd like to give and then um, you know you know let's say you end the semester with a project that you're really proud of um, I think that's a really good time to start you know it, it doesn't have to be the final but at least start the process because um, trying to condense a semester or a quarter worth of work into two or three pages, uh, it's really humbling, right? So you wanna do the process earlier in your, in your academic career than later, because it'll really focus what you do during the semester the, in the next semester. And I would say that if you do it when the memory of the experience is fresh, this is mm -hmm. facilitating yes. your work. If you go back to a project mm -hmm. one year later and you're trying to put it back together, mm -hmm. it will not have the same energy as if you do it. So you spend a bit of, maybe you are exhausted at the end of the semester, but if you can find some time to, to rework the, the submission, or maybe there was a fantastic plan that would be great if it was a little bit touched up, you know, try to do that as soon as possible. So you actually, crystallize that experience. One of the things that students tend to do is that they discard sketches when they're not appealing or they're not great sketches. And I always mentioned that Ms. Nandro 
you know, according to certain parameters, he couldn't draw, but actually he could definitely draw because he could see space, he could see construction. Um, so just be mindful that, you know, certain sketches might have an incredible value uh, for, for those who look at them. Mm -hmm. Particularly if they are experts in the field, so you are um, talking to architects rather than multi firms that maybe want to see uh, different um, different qualities, different skills. But that is certainly something not to underestimate. But and, and also, um, it's a very good point about connecting your portfolio and your CV together. And as you're working on projects, as you get into um, your career whether you're an intern architect or a junior architect, um, also record the factual information about a project. So yes. if, if you yes. can remember the, the cost of the project, the square yeah. footage, um, and other details of it, it's good because you know when you get 10 years into your career, you may not remember <laughs> any of that. Um, and so jot it all down and, and record it. And so it's, if you're, you know, eventually you're going to have this long list of projects that you've worked on, which can be impressive, but give people something they can relate to. So if you're applying for a project manager, they can they can scroll down. Each project is described briefly, um, but you know how big it was, what it cost, when it was completed, and all of those sorts of things. And that can be in, incredibly valuable. So you've got to document your career. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Also that... Um, maybe archiving is very important. I also think that you should probably start to learn a, a graphic tool um, like InDesign and Photoshop so that you are comfortable to use it when it comes time to put the, the portfolio together. I don't know if, um, I, I would suggest InDesign, but I think there are other ones out there. Um, um, maybe others could comment on what software um, that students, uh, you would recommend to students. Unfortunately, I only know InDesign. I don't know of other. So our, at our school, our students get Adobe for free. So we rely on it heavily. If I may say, Douglas has mentioned this a couple of times already, that the, um, the portfolio is a live document. And the more you head in, you maybe engage in more complex projects, you will see that you will have to collate data in a different way. It's always a good opportunity to try to rework or review the previous part of the portfolio and make the presentation of data, visual data sets consistently. So, uh, you know, the, the layout, the, the, the structure of the data, the, any information that you want to um, present about different projects is read in the same way, because this is really helping to understand what is the evolution of your career really at glance. Mm -hmm. There's, um, there's maybe two more questions we can touch upon. And, and one of them is, is um, after you finished a project, uh, let's say earlier in your academic career, um, is it okay to go back and, and revise it, you know, years later when you've kind of had more time to think about it or develop your skills? What are your thoughts on that? Revisiting projects you have completed? Absolutely. It's your portfolio. That's right. Design is never complete, right? <laughs> Yeah. You always want to put your best work. Not I only, do want to, yeah. Not only is it never complete, mm -hmm. the sad fact of the matter is when I started out, you know, we were d starting to do layout, we had Quark Express and PageMaker. <laughs> I and, remember um, those. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the, the sad fact of it is you're going to find pieces of software that simply in design may disappear one day. And mm -hmm. um, then you're going to have to be agile and Make sure that you, Henry said archiving, archive in a manner that allows you to be agile and move your materials back and forth. And God only knows, we may see within um, the next five to 10 years that everybody will want to see everything in real time virtual reality. Um, and so we have, you have to be prepared for all of those things. And it's going to be, not only is it a living document, but it's a learning process that will continue throughout your entire life. I see a comment question from Brent Taylor and I, this, um, uh, you know, I, I do want to uh, address this one. Yes, absolutely. So his, um, he has a background as a cabinet maker, carpenter, furniture design, uh, and maybe some contracting as well. Should that be featured? Yes. Um, you know, so we had another online student, he was actually from Canada, um, but he had spent, again, similarly, uh, I think a decade, maybe more, 
uh, running his own kind of metal fabrication shop. Um, and, you know, so he was older. And so upon graduation, uh, you know, he's about 10 or plus years older than, let's say, your kind of quote unquote traditional or the typical student. Um, and it was a little awkward because sometimes, it, 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 you know, including at the practice interview, because he's around the same age as the person who's interviewing him. And so the advice there is that you know you, you really want to highlight up front um, that fact uh, because um, not only is that metal shop experience um, so he you know he's he's run um, you know he's a managed staff right he's uh, you know not only is the craft relevant but also just the business aspect of uh, you know running a, a team um, the managing the interpersonal dynamics all of that is super relevant experience that the younger students don't have and need to learn. Right. So if you have something like that, if you have those lived experiences, um, you, I think it's important to um, not underestimate what a huge asset that is. Absolutely. I, I agree 100 percent. I think that um, all of your experiences, whether they're designing a building or, or crafting a piece of art or, you know, piece of furniture is, is all part of the the um, creative profession and, mm -hmm. and is really important to demonstrate those skills. Okay, well, I think, um, th I think we've kind of hit upon um, most of the questions. If anyone has any further questions, please feel free to um, email me and I can distribute them around and we can uh, try to get answers back for you. Um, and uh, please do join us on January 7th. I just want to uh, thank all of our speakers uh, for joining us today and thank you all for, for participating for uh, for the studio and we look forward to to the next one. And Thank if you. I could just add, Veronica, all of the speakers today volunteered their time to be with you. Um, so we really do owe them a, a big note of thanks because we know your time is extremely valuable. But I think um, from just from reading the comments in the chat, it seems that this has been very well received and uh, very helpful for students and interns of all of all types. So thank you, everybody. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again and, and working with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Good luck, Thank everyone. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.